As we begin our time together this morning, let's come before God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for the way that it speaks to us of who you are and your love for us. Lord, this morning as we gather as your people to worship you online, we ask that you would come and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Have your way with this time together, God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're continuing our series called Who Is He? Looking at the most important ever asked, uh, most important question ever asked, who is Jesus? And uh, this morning we're looking at Jesus as the teacher. We're looking at some of the words of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. And that sermon begins with what's become known as the Beatitudes. And there's a call to worship that I'd like to lead us in now based around those Beatitudes before we watch a media clip together. This is a call to all those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is a call to all those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This is a call to all those who are meek, for they will inherit the earth. This is a call to all those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is a call for all those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is a call for all those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. And this is a call to all those who are peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. This is a call to all those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, or falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. May we know his blessing this morning. Let's watch the media clip now. So here on a mountainside, not far from Capernaum, in the midst of a crowd of people, Jesus starts his sermon by proclaiming a series of beatitudes or brief blessings Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew 5, 3 through 12. When Jesus taught the crowds here, he had to deal with a flawed concept held by the Jewish people. They wanted a political leader who would lead them out of Roman occupation and oppression. They expected a Messiah who would show compassion to the Jews alone. They thought that being a a child of Abraham was reason enough for the Messiah to accept them. But Jesus turned those concepts upside down. Instead of leading a rally to overthrow Rome, he called those who had been shown oppression blessed. Crazier sounding still to the ears of many, he called on them to love their oppressors, love their rulers, and love those who curse them. So we continue in worship and I encourage you to join in at home as we sing together, Awake, Awake, O Zion. Okay. 
God reigns. He is King of all the earth. Our God reigns. And He's seated on the throne. Lift your voice and sing a song of praise. Our God reigns. Our God is with us now, wherever we are. And however our lives are going at the moment, our God is with us now. A few things to let you know about by way of notices in the life of our church. Uh, you should hopefully have received these bookmarks by now. If you haven't received them yet, then please do uh, contact the church office or get in contact with me and I'll make sure that you get one of those, I think most people have got them, maybe one or two that we haven't managed to get to yet. As long as we're not all snowed in, uh, then please let me know and I'll, I'll drop them through your door um, if you're local to Car Shorten Beaches this coming week. Later on in the year, we'll be doing uh, the third part of the series called Who Were They? And for this, we really need some of your help. We're looking to... Uh, get some uh, opinion from you to do a bit of a straw poll to find out who are the people throughout history and in the Bible who really inspire you and motivate you and encourage you to live your life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So maybe it's a figure through history who lived their life a certain way, maybe famous or not so famous, uh, that you could just send me their name and perhaps a little bit about them and why you think that they would be a good person 
for us to focus on as we look at this great cloud of witnesses who surround us to encourage us and motivate us as we seek to live our lives as disciples of Jesus. We've been having a bit of a push on our small groups uh, at the beginning of this new year. Uh, just a reminder about that, if you would like to be part of a small group, a great way to stay connected with one another and with God, to build relationships and friendships which can help us through the ups and downs of life, and also a great way to go on and, and in, uh, go, go on in our walk with God, in our discipleship of Jesus Christ. And the last thing to let you know about is if you are a church member, then we are going to have a church members meeting on February the 2nd, but it will be a meeting with a difference as everything is different at the moment. We're going to be meeting via Zoom, so uh, at 8 o'clock on the 2nd of February, church members meeting via Zoom will have some breakout groups within that Zoom meeting so we can actually get a chance to input and pray together. Uh, if you've got any questions about that, if you need some technical help, if you don't know how to use Zoom, um, then please do contact me fill at beachesbaptist.org and I'll try and give you some help if at all possible. We would like as many church members there present at that meeting as possible. So as I said, we're continuing in our series, Who is He? Looking at the most important question that could ever be asked, who is Jesus? And I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 5, starting at verses, uh, verse 13 through to verse 30 and skipping to verse 38 and on to verse 48. So Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 13. These are the words of Jesus as he's speaking to his followers on the Sermon on the Mount. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds And glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Rakar, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there Remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown in prison. Truly I tell you, You will not go out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you or take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Some amazing words there as we consider those, that teaching of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. We know that the pandemic at the moment is causing disruption and problems and difficulties in all kinds of different ways throughout the world at the moment. And uh, Tear Fund as an organisation, a Christian organisation, have put together uh, a prayer resource for people to use, featuring uh, people from all over the world, praying that God would be with us and help us and break in and resolve this whole situation with the pandemic, that he would be with those who are most vulnerable and uh, in need at this time. So we're going to watch that now and use it to help us to pray. As the earth is shaken, you are calling us to be still. Be still, not afraid. Nem passividade that you will be exalted among the earth. Be still. Be creative. A être généreux. A ser amables. Believe and trust that you are God. A estar quietos. Be mindful. A ser tu pueblo, tu amado. Lord, we bring our hopes to you. Our families. Our finances. Nossa saúde. E em nossa quietude. Em nossos hogares, em nossos negócios, em nossos hospitales. Tu saidia kuona unayo tenda. We pray for wars to cease. Oramos para que cesen las guerras, para que las armas se destruyan. Let our peace declared as we face this together. We pray for the people trapped in their homes. With those who do them harm to help to be released and restored. We pray for communities unable to isolate. Obligés de cohabiter, craignant d'être infectés. Ayúdalas a estar seguras y sanas. Nusalli min ajli shifa el marba. Ivai nao, mukushunguru tuwa nukuchema kwa. Acompaña a las personas en medio de su ansiedad y aflicción. Help us to be still. As you are exalted among the nations, exalted in all the earth. Até mesmo nesse momento. Be with us. Be our fortress, Almighty God. Amen. We continue in sung worship, and again, I encourage you to join in at home. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was 
What incredible words we've just been singing. We are children of God. I wonder what response you would give to the following question. Who was the best teacher you ever had? Maybe you know straight away or perhaps you need a little bit more time to think. Perhaps it was a school teacher or a university university lecturer. Who was the best teacher you ever learned from? And what was it that made them so good? Was it their style or perhaps their enthusiasm? Maybe their depth of knowledge in what they were teaching or their ability to make things easy to grasp and understand? What makes you choose that particular teacher over all the others? As we continue through our Who Is He series, looking for biblical answers to that most important question we could ever ask, who is Jesus? So far we've looked at Jesus the God-man, Jesus being fully human and fully divine all at the same time. And we've considered Jesus the prophet, the one who speaks the word of God and embodies the word of God for us. Today, we think about Jesus, the teacher. Teacher is the second most common title used to refer to Jesus directly in the Gospels. Second only to the title, Lord. It's used somewhere between 45 and 60 times, depending on the way that you translate or the translation of the Bible that you're using. There can be little doubt that Jesus was widely thought of as a teacher by those around him as he walked the dusty roads of Israel around 2,000 years ago. 
as Nicodemus begins his discussion with Jesus in John 3, he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. And Mark states how the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching, the teaching of Jesus in chapter 11, verse 18. And Jesus even referred to himself as a teacher in Mark 14, 14, as he is making plans with his disciples for the Last Supper. The teacher asks, where is my guest room? He told the disciples to say to the person whose room it was. And Jesus taught many different people. He taught multitudes, Mark 6, verse 30 to 44, the feeding of the 5,000. That's a lot of people to be teaching all at once. He he taught individuals as well. Have you just thought about Nicodemus? He taught small groups. His disciples, sometimes he called them together and, and, and had some specific, specific teaching for them. He even taught his adversaries, those who were against him, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He taught in the temple, he taught in synagogues, he taught in houses, he taught from a boat on a hillside, at a well, over mills, on the road, by the shore. He taught anywhere and everywhere to anyone who would listen and even to some who wouldn't. The most common term that they would have used back then for a teacher is rabbi, especially the kind of teacher that Jesus was. Rabbis were spiritual teachers who travelled from place to place, recruiting students who agreed with their particular version of the Torah, the law of God, their particular version about how to live as a follower of God at that time, as one of the people of God. These disciples, these students, as they were called, disciples, would literally follow their rabbi around as he walked along the dusty roads. They would form a line behind him. The kind of head student, the best student, the rabbi's favourite student often, would be immediately behind him and then going back. The ones at the back perhaps were at the bottom of the class, we might describe it. And there was a popular greeting at the time where disciples from different rabbis would perhaps see each other out and they would say, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. This was a wish from one disciple to another that they would be at the top of the class, that they would be so close that they would understand the teaching of their rabbi so well that as they walked, as his sandals walked on the dusty road, the dust would be flicked up and would cover them. Jesus was recognised as a rabbi because he taught and had a group of disciples who followed him around. But he was a rabbi like no other. Let's consider some of the ways that he taught. Jesus taught firstly from God's word. He knew the story of Israel. Remember the story of him when his parents accidentally left him at the temple when he was just 12 years old. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question on another occasion. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I don't think anyone has ever come up with a better summary of the entire Old Testament and story of God than that. Jesus knew the word of God and he taught from God's word. He also taught using stories or parables. Remember the story of the sower or the story of the prodigal son. And we're going to be looking at one of the parables in a couple of weeks' time in our all-age service. Emma and Becca and the team will be helping us with that. But Jesus used stories because stories connect with real life, don't they? And stories engage our imaginations and immerse us in that particular teaching. Jesus also taught using everyday situations, the world around him, farming or the festivals that were taking place, birds or flowers. He used everyday things to teach people. He used metaphor as well. He said, you are salt and light. He said things about himself in metaphors. I am the light of the world. And we're going to be looking at some of those I am sayings of Jesus later on in the series. 
He also taught through debates. Rabbis love to debate with one another and try and argue why their particular opinion was right and the others wrong or better than the other ones. Jesus often responded. He was always ready to respond, whether in word or action, to those who questioned him, to those who accused him even, those who tried to, to, to catch him out. Perhaps most uniquely, though, and most perfectly, Jesus taught through example. His walk matched his talk. So Jesus was regarded as a teacher by those around him. He taught in all kinds of ways at different times and in different places. And he used different techniques in his teaching. But what did he teach? What was his curriculum, if you like? Well, perhaps we can sum it up in this term, this phrase, the kingdom of God. All of the teaching of Jesus can be grouped together under this umbrella. In chapters 5 to 7 of Matthew's Gospel, he groups together a whole bunch of the teaching of Jesus in what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. We read some of it, just a small section of it, earlier on. John Stott calls this Sermon on the Mount of Jesus, Jesus' own description of what he wanted his followers to be and to do. Many have described it as his kingdom manifesto. A collection of the teaching of Jesus which unpacks the kingdom of God and summarises his teaching. Perhaps we could call it his curriculum. And it's quite a curriculum, I can tell you. Before we look at the content of some of that amazing Sermon on the Mount, we first need to consider its context. It's set within the essential theme of the whole Bible from beginning to end, which is that God's purpose is to call out for himself a people, and that this people is a holy people, set apart from the world, to belong to him and to obey him, and that its vocation is to be holy, perfect, different in all its outlook and behaviour. As God said to the people soon after he had rescued them from slavery, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt where you used to live and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. The Old Testament tells the story of how the Israelites kept forgetting their uniqueness as the people of God. They mingled with the nations and learned to do as they did. So they demanded a king to govern over them, like all the other nations, they said. They worshipped idols and turned their back on God time and time again. So God kept sending his prophets to them to call them back to be his people, to remind them who they were and to plead them to follow his ways. But God's people would not listen to his voice and sinned against him by walking in the customs and lifestyle of the nations. All of this is the essential background for a proper understanding of the Sermon on the Mount and the teaching of Jesus as a whole. Jesus had come to announce the good news that the kingdom of God was at hand. Jesus himself came to inaugurate it, to bring it in, to bring it to fruition and fulfilment. With him, the new age had dawned and the rule of God had broken into history. The Sermon on the Mount and the teaching of Jesus is to be seen in this context. It describes for all those who would be part of God's family, the repentance, the complete change of mind and the righteousness which belongs to the kingdom of God. It describes what human life and human community look like when they come under the gracious rule of God. In his teaching, Jesus calls us to be holy, to be different from the world around us, to be set apart for our God. Our character is to be completely distinct from that admired by the world. We are to shine like lights in the darkness. 
Our righteousness is to exceed that even of the scribes and the Pharisees, both in ethical behavior and in religious devotion. And if we know anything about the Pharisees and the scribes, they were fastidious in their seeking to follow the law and be righteous. Jesus says our righteousness must exceed that. Our love is to be greater and our ambition nobler than those of the world around us. Just listen and reflect on the magnitude of some of the things Jesus taught in this incredible Sermon on the Mount. Think about what it would actually look like to put this into practice and to live it out day by day. Jesus said these things as he taught. Anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who looks at a woman lustily has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Remember who Jesus was speaking to as he said these words. People under occupation by foreign rule. Where your treasure is, your heart, there your heart will be also. You cannot serve both God and money. Do not worry about your life. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Small is the gate. And narrow the road that leads to life and only few find it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now that's quite a curriculum, isn't it? Quite a manifesto, if you like. How different would the world be if everyone lived in this way? How different would the church be if we all lived in this way? Nothing short of perfection is required. That's the pass mark. That's the grade that you have to attain. Perfection. To play on the, on the words of the band Fairground Attraction, it's got to be perfect. Too many people take second best, but God won't take anything less. It's got to be perfect. But there's a problem, isn't there, here? To put it bluntly, we just ain't perfect, are we? No matter how hard we try, and many have tried very hard, perhaps you have tried. We all fall short of God's perfect standard. And this brings us to the second main thrust of Jesus' teaching. If the first main element is holiness and perfection, the standard of God, the second main element is grace. Because God loves us, because he couldn't leave us in our hopeless state of imperfection, because God is full of mercy, he has come to rescue us through Jesus. If the first main element is in the teaching of God is in the teaching of Jesus is that God demands perfection, the second main element is that God attains that perfection for us himself in Jesus because of his grace. In Jesus, God himself has come to live our life and die our death so that we can be caught up in him and attain that which we could never, ever attain on our own. Perfection. Through faith in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection, we suddenly do make the grade. We have passed the final exam with full marks. 
all of our coursework is marked 100%, A, star, 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 star. This is the grace of God at work in Jesus. And this is what Jesus taught. God lavishes his love on us, that which we do not deserve. The teaching of Jesus declares this loud and clear, both in word and in example, in deed. We would do well to maintain a healthy balance between those two main elements of God's, of Jesus' teaching. God demands perfection, holiness. God is a God of grace who, through Jesus, enables us to attain to that perfection as we put our faith in him. The first element reveals how we cannot make the grade on our own. We fall short. The second element reveals how Jesus has done it for us. And some people get stuck on the, second, on the first element. And think that we have to try and try and try and try in our own strength to be good, to get it right. If I do this, God, will you accept me? Will you love me if I do this, if I am this, if I behave this way? If I can sort this problem out, if I say sorry to that person, will you accept me? Will I be good enough, God? And that just leads to a pretty depressing life, actually. Because the reality is that we can't. And in our own strength, we're not acceptable to God. We all fall short of his glory. Others skip straight to the second element and make the mistake of believing that the way we live doesn't really matter because God sorted it all out in Jesus anyway. Both those perspectives are equally wrong. We need to have a balance in our understanding and attitude. This is what Jesus taught. God is perfect. God is holy and he calls us to be holy. We can't do it on our own. But God has done it through Jesus because of his grace. Holiness and grace. We need to keep that balance as Jesus did in his teaching. This is who we are as the people of God, as disciples of Jesus. This is what it means to be church, to be God's people. To recognize this is who God is. And this is who he calls us to be, holy. To recognise we can't do it on our own. And to accept the help that God gives through Jesus because he is grace. To enable us to attain to that. And so we're able to sing because of all that God has done in Jesus. As we're going to in a few moments, we are your church. We need your power in us. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here, we pray. Amen. So we're going to continue in sung worship as we sing those words together and perhaps we can use those as a response to God's word this morning. We can use them to say, God, I know I'm no good on my own. Thank you for Jesus, my saviour. Thank you for calling us together to be, to be your people. Thank you that through faith in Christ, through the power of your spirit working in us, we can be light in the darkness. We can be a holy people. Again, I invite you to join at home as we sing together.
accept your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze and hope. Like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. Meet your power in us. Seek your kingdom first. Hunger and we thirst. Fuse to waste our lives. sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives wherever it swells. We are your church. Pray, revive, serve. Build your kingdom. say our prayer now God that you would build your kingdom here here in our lives as individuals God come and fill us with your Holy Spirit build your kingdom in our lives so that people may when they meet us meet you so that your kingdom would grow so that you would heal our streets and land And we say, God, build your kingdom here in your church. Lord, especially at this time when we cannot gather together, would you be continuing your work of building us up? Perhaps as we wait upon you, God. Build our unity with one another. Help us in the way that we love one another. Help us to stay connected with one another and with you. Build your kingdom here in this church that we may be salt and light for you in this community. And Lord, we say build your kingdom here in this place, in Carshorton and Beaches. May your kingdom rule and reign. Win over all. Build your kingdom, God. May your will be done and your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. Now, as we close this time together and go about the rest of this day and the week ahead, we seek your blessing in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So thank you for joining us this morning.
It's great to, uh, that you've been able to be with us. Please do contact me throughout the week if there are ways that I can play, pray for you, or if uh, you just like a chat, Phil at beachesbaptist.org, or my number is publicized. Uh, it's great to have had you with us. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.